CBS Sports, Major League Baseball. The Big Red Machine had been out of service since the 70s, but Larkin and Sabo have rebuilt Cincinnati's title hopes, and Eric Davis has the Reds hitting on all cylinders again. For the Phillies, the season's been tough as nails, with baseball's number one hitter Lenny Dykstra leading by example and rewriting this Philadelphia story. Roger Craig's pitching staff isn't what it used to be, but with all-star performers like Matt Williams, the Giants' hopes of a World Series return remain alive. For Don Zimmer, it's been almost too painful to watch. Injury after injury has forced the defending NL East champs into an early hibernation. Off the field, we'll take a look at Steinbrenner versus Vincent with an historic perspective of what commissioners have done to police the game in the past. And which Pete Rose will Hall of Fame voters remember, Charlie Hustle or The Hustler? Major League Baseball is next on CBS Sports. everyone, I'm Greg Gumbel. Welcome once again to Major League Baseball here on CBS. Today, some of you will see the Philadelphia Phillies take on the Cincinnati Reds live from Riverfront Stadium where the rain has stopped, but there is an 80% chance of it continuing this afternoon. Jack Buck and Tim McCarver have their umbrellas handy. They'll bring you that game. Others will go out to sunny Wrigley Field for a matchup between the Cubs and the Giants in Chicago. Dick Stockton and Jim Cott will call that action. But first, to update you on some late-night scores, last night, Jose Canseco's two home runs, he has 28 for the year, weren't enough to lift Oakland past Toronto. The Blue Jays won it 8-6. California beat the Cleveland Indians in Anaheim 9-4. And in Texas, the Rangers beat Detroit, and the story once again was Nolan Ryan. Ryan pitched six innings on a one-hit yield. He won his 299th career game. He will go for number 300 on Wednesday night in Arlington, Texas, against the New York Yankees. Meanwhile, in golf, third round play of the British Open finds Nick Faldo with a four-shot lead over Ian Baker Finch. That action taking place, of course, in Scotland at St. Andrews. And when we come back, we'll round up the considerable action off the field in baseball this week. CBS Sports presents Major League Baseball. Today's pregame is brought to you by Sharp Electronics Corporation. From sharp minds come sharp products. And by Sears Craftsman. People who depend on tools depend on craftsmen. All eyes in the baseball world remain on Faye Vincent as the commissioner ponders the fate of Yankee owner George Steinbrenner. A ruling on that case is expected by the end of next week. As Andrea Joyce reports, Commissioner Vincent has virtually unlimited power to handle this matter, on authority dating back to baseball's biggest scandal, the 1919 Chicago Black Sox. Regardless of the verdict of juries, no player who throws a ball game, no player who undertakes or promises to throw a game, no player who sits in conference with a bunch of crooked players and gamblers where the ways and means of throwing a ball game are discussed and does not promptly tell his club about it will ever play professional baseball again. As baseball's first commissioner, Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis quickly laid down one ironclad rule. Anything deemed not in the best interest of baseball could be dealt with however the commissioner saw fit. Over the years, the mandate has held up. In 1947, Brooklyn Dodgers manager Leo DeRocher was suspended for associating with gamblers. Tiger pitcher Denny McLean was suspended in 1970 also for gambling involvement. Last summer, it was the Pete Rose ordeal in a lifetime ban from the game. The banishment for life of Pete Rose from baseball is the, is the sad end of a sorry episode. One of the game's greatest players has engaged in a variety of acts which have stained the game. And now, another possible stain on baseball is being investigated. The $40,000 payment by New York Yankee owner George Steinbrenner to self-described gambler Howard Spira. This summer, the Steinbrenner saga is casting the first shadow of the 90s on the national game. It's a shadow that reaches far beyond Yankee Stadium, and it's one that's raising all kinds of questions throughout the baseball community. 
The most troubling question is why did Steinbrenner give Spira the money? Steinbrenner claims it was extortion. Spira has been indicted on those charges, but Spira, once an employee of the Dave Winfield Foundation, says he was paid for something else. I gave George all the information and all the dirt that he needed to destroy Dave Winfield and his reputation. I wanted information if I was being ripped off. If something was illegal in the foundation, which he said it was. This week, the commissioner's confidential report was leaked, revealing new claims by Steinbrenner that Spira threatened his life, a claim some find suspect. Apparently, uh, he told baseball something entirely differently uh, that he told to the uh, prosecuting authorities. Still, others who've dealt with Spira find Steinbrenner's claim easy to believe. Howard Spira had at one point uh, frightened my daughter half to death by telling her that he was going to have me killed, and in very graphic terms, too. While sorting through the confusing testimony, Commissioner Faye Vincent is keenly aware of the power of his office. Two baseball owners have been expelled in the past. Phillies owner William Cox for betting on his team's games. And Cardinals owner Fred Sy lost his team after a tax fraud conviction. Based on the power commissioners have exercised in the past, some say a stiff penalty for Steinbrenner is imminent. I would expect that he'd have a long suspension, a big fine, and I think we possibly have seen the last of George around the Yankees after this decision is made. Now, in addition to the Steinbrenner saga, baseball saw Pete Rose get his jail sentence this week, five months for filing false tax returns. The question now, will Rose ever see the Hall of Fame? I spoke earlier today with Jack Lang, head of the Baseball Writers Association of America, the group that votes for the Hall of Famers, and I asked him about rumors that Rose wants to be left off his first Hall of Fame ballot. If, in fact, Pete Rose do, uh, does sometime ask the baseball writers to keep him off the first ballot in 1992, our answer would have to be no, because I checked with the Hall of Fame, and they say the rules are the rules. When a man becomes eligible, he has to go on the ballot. Jack, what's your feeling as to whether he should be in a Hall of Fame or not, and what is the general feeling you get from the other voters? Well, the first thing, I, I'm glad I have another year and a half before I have to make the decision. But as each day goes by, I'm becoming more... Uh, uh, more convinced that he belongs in the Hall of Fame I, because I think what we're going to be voting on is not Pete Rose the individual but Pete Rose the ball player just as the judge said in court there are two Pete Roses and the Pete Rose who was the ball player definitely belongs in the Hall of Fame. Jack Lang. From baseball to basketball now, the University of Nevada, Las Vegas says it will appeal its one-year ban on postseason play handed down yesterday by the NCAA. For now, the running Rebels will not defend their national title. And just a few moments ago, I talked with UNLV head coach and target of the investigation, Jerry Tarkanian. I asked him how the probation will affect the Rebels in the coming season. They will, they'll never leave the program. I don't, I don't fear that at all. None of our kids will. We, we have a great group of kids who are extremely loyal. I think something like this is just going to uh, even unite our club even more and more and it, uh, well, we may be just so good that we'll really disappoint a lot of people. Stars Stacy Ogman and Larry Johnson are the ones at issue here. Bo Jackson coming up. Stay tuned. We'll be back with more in just a moment. Well, it wasn't all bad in baseball and sports this week. In fact, we could all learn a little from one man's actions. Kansas City Royals outfielder Bo Jackson was a busy man on Tuesday here in New York. Early in the day, he stopped by Sesame Street, where Bo met Peep. Bo, you don't know Peep. Yeah, but I will in a minute. Watch this. Hi, I'm Bo Jackson. Oh, hi, I'm Peep. Bo Peep. <laughs> <laughs> And then that night, Bo taught the Yankees a thing or two about hitting home runs. And that does it for now. We thank you for joining us. I'm Greg Gumbel. Right now, we are ready for baseball. I'll be back throughout the afternoon with scores and highlights. CBS Sports coverage of Major League Baseball continues after this word from your local station. Get the inside pitch on the red at 5.30.
You're taking a look at downtown Cincinnati. It's Ohio's Queen City. On the banks of the Ohio as CBS Sports presents Major League Baseball. Riverfront Stadium houses the Cincinnati Reds on their number one in the West. And today they host the Philadelphia Phillies. Taking a look at the standings in the East, the Mets, they've won 22 out of 29 and still can't catch the Pirates. Philadelphia's playing better than expected. Cincinnati leads by nine, 10 on the loss side over the Giants, and some say it's over. These kids think the pennant race is over. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jack Buck. You know you can walk to Riverfront Stadium from downtown Cincinnati. And when you do and come to the offices, in this trophy case, you see a salute to Hall of Famer Johnny Bench. Other trophies, a bronze of Pete Rose. But what the people of Cincinnati remember most of all are the championship years. 75 when they beat the Red Sox, 76 over the Yankees. The 80s were dry. A lot of good players, but no winners. But now it's 1990. Lou Pinella is here. And since opening day, the Reds, who lead by nine, have been in first place. Tim McCarver, a lot of people think a new big red machine is in the making. Jack, I guess you could say a sleeker, trimmed down version of the big red machine. Gone are Pete Rose and Johnny Bench. You mentioned them. Tony Perez, of course, is no longer here. Uh, Joe Morgan's no longer here. Today, the Reds characterized by Chris Sabo, Eric Davis, and of course, Barry Larkin. Barry, did you follow the Big Red Machine when you grew up? Well, actually, I didn't. Uh, I was out there, <laughs> I was out playing myself. Uh, you know, I knew of Davey Concepcion, of Pete Rose, of Tony Perez, but, uh, you know, the championship years when they were doing so well, I was out playing myself. What about uh, you have opened up a 10-game lead with the San Francisco Giants, 10 games in the loss column. What's it going to take for you guys not to win the division this year? Well, I think we're going to have to avoid the injuries. Uh, the thing that happened last year with the injuries just devastated the ball club. But I think that's, I think that's the major thing. Uh, if everybody stays relatively healthy and, and can go out there and continue to play consistently, then I think we're going to be all right. All right, Barry, thank you very much. We will be seeing the healthy Cincinnati Reds today for the first time here on CBS. Terry Mulholland against Jose Rijo. CBS Sports presents Major League Baseball. Today's game is brought to you by Pontiac and your local Pontiac dealer. We build excitement. Duracell, the copper top battery. And by new Bud Dry, cold filtered for smooth draft taste and dry brewed for no aftertaste. Cincinnati has averaged more than 31,000 per game at home this year. They've won six out of ten from Philadelphia, and they take the field right now. We've already had the singing of our national anthem, and the umpires have taken the lineup cards. Pitcher Jose Rijo will be a little bit late coming out there. He is just off the disabled list. Went down to Nashville to get a game under his belt, and then come back to work. And now there goes Rio to the mound. Rio during his career is three and three against Philadelphia and has a five three mark this season. Rio rehab huh down right. in Nashville defensively for the Cincinnati Reds Billy Hatcher in left field coming over from the Pirates earlier in the year. Eric Davis's name is synonymous with gold glove. Eric Davis in center Glenn Braggs who is who came over from the Milwaukee Brewers earlier. Chris Sabo at third base, starter in the All-Star game, also in the All-Star game. Barry Larkin, a local Cincinnati product. Mariano Duncan at second base. Remember the trade with the Dodgers last year? The biggest surprise Lou Pinella has seen this year. Todd Bensinger coming from Boston in the Nick Kosaski trade two years ago. Joe Oliver behind the plate. And as Jack said on the mound, Jose Rijo. And here's the lineup which will confront Rio this afternoon. Lenny Dykster leads it off. Darren Dalton, the catcher, bats second. Tommy Hur at second. Von Hayes in right field. Carmelo Martinez in left. Ricky Jordan at first. Dickie Thon at short. Charlie Hayes at third. And Mulholland will pitch. Terry Mulholland, the left-hander. Here's Lenny Dykstra leading the league in hitting and number one in walks with a total of 59. And of course, therefore, number one in on-base percentage. He leads the National League by 10 points over Barry Bonds. And last night, the first pitch of the game, 
sent him sprawling. And later in the game, these two teams had a rumble involving Norm Charlton, the pitcher, and both benches cleared. Here we go with Riho to like to Dykstra, and they have to play in a third to guard against the bunt. And that pitch caught the inside corner for a call strike one. There's Nick Leba. Looks like Pancho Villa these days with the mustache. And Lou Pinello, the manager of the first place red. He walked into a winner over here. Riho gets ahead on the count. Dykstra is a very patient hitter these days. And the pitch is foul, and it looks like they're trying to pitch him in, 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 Tim. Well, he's standing right on top of the plate. I think a lot of teams try to pitch him in. You got to get Dykstra away from the plate. The biggest difference this year is with two strikes, Dykstra has not put the ball in play. In past years, he's been putting those lazy fly balls in play the other way. You can see he's almost out of the box <laughs> at back foot, right on the back line of the batter's box. And the line is considered part of the batter's box, so he stays right there with an 0-2 count. And he hits one softly to first, and that's the way this one starts with Benzinger making the unassisted putout. The plate umpire today is Dana DeMuth. Charlie Williams at first. The crew chief is John McSherry. He took a tumble last night during the rumble. And Bob Davidson umpiring at third. Hitting second, and this is an unusual batting spot for Darren Dalton, the left-handed hitting catcher of the Phillies. Batting 242 with four home runs. Rio throws high for ball one, and he can pump the ball. Has an earned run average of 3.96. He has no complete games. He gets his share of strikeouts. He throws a strike, and it's one and one. Darren Dalton, normally the number eight spot hitter, told me he was getting a lot of good pitches to hit from that two spot. You get a lot of fastballs with speed on it first. You follow that one away. Especially with Dykstra getting on as much as he has. This is the seventh game that Dalton has batted second. And is getting a lot better pitches to hit than he got in that number eight spot. Ordinarily, you see a much faster runner hitting in the number two spot, but Nick Leva is going against the book and getting some good results. Reho is ahead on the count. And a foul out of play. Keeps it one and two. I think the type of hitter that you have in the number two spot is more important than the speed of the runner. I think you got to have a guy who makes contact, who doesn't strike out a lot. If a runner's at second and nobody out, you move the runner to third. That type of hitter. And that's what the type of hitter Darren Dalton hopes to develop as. Here the pop fly on the infield. And who wants it? Somebody better take charge. It'll work it. That's the second out. A couple of people stayed away, but Larkin made the catch. This is a hitter's ballpark. It's only 330 down the line in left and in right. 375 in the power alleys. 404 in center. And by the way, these fielders can go over the top of the wall to make catches. Eric Davis does that almost frequently. And 375 and 330 in right center and right field. This is Tom Herr. He missed last night's game. He has a pulled muscle on the top of his thigh. Switch hitter ball one. Hitting 265. Another fellow who knows the strike zone. Longtime Cardinal. I want to tell you when the Cardinals were going down the stretch in 82, 85, and 7, he was a tough, tough player. He's been hot since the All Star break, and he hits a pass single. That's typical of his hitting, and that's the first base runner of the afternoon. Well, with two out and nobody on, Chris Sabo elected to play her shallow. Not much of a chance for her to be bunting. But you can say, see because of the threat and because Sabo was so shallow, he's actually in front of the baseline. Tommy Herr has a base hit. Now, probably had Sabo been back, he feels that ball. Yeah, he didn't have time to take even a step. Took a half step and the ball went by him. Well, Von Hayes could give the Phillies a running start. He's been out for a while with a bad knee. There's a good strike from Rio. Sound like a cannon shot when it thumped into Oliver's glove. He must throw a heavy ball. 
Ron Hayes always a threat. Nine home runs. Has some opposite field power. And a good batting eye as well. One ball, one strike. Jose Rijo features a fastball, a slider, and a split finger fastball. Talking to his father in law, Juan Marichal, at the All Star game. And Marichal thinks that the reason he hurt his arm was because of that split finger fastball. There's a throw to first, and Herr gets back with two out. You're right, and Marichal was half angry when he was saying that story that the split finger delivery raises heck with not only Rijo's pitching arm, but with others. So it's a theory to be discussed. One and one to Von Hayes. That's a strike on the corner. One and two, and Rijo doesn't mind pitching inside, doesn't he? He was clocked at 92 miles an hour with that delivery. Two out single by her, top of the first. Her has stolen five bases. There he goes. And there is a base hit into right center. And they might try. He's not running very well, so her had to hold up at third as they get the ball back in on another day. That might have been a run for Philadelphia. Yeah, that's exactly right because it may have scooted into right field and the fact that Duncan gets a glove on it prevented it possibly from going to the fence. Watch Mariano Duncan just slow it down enough to where Glenn Braggs can feel the ball and hold her who was running on the pitch to third base. And her was just barely motoring when he chugged into third base with that injury as a an injury on the top of his right thigh. Carmelo Martinez is now the man of the moment. Hitting 228 with seven home runs. He swings hard all the time. Ball one. Two on, two out, first inning. So it doesn't matter how hard you throw. We mentioned the 92 mile an hour delivery from Rijo. But two base hits, her at third, and Von Hayes, who is a threat to run over at first. He probably won't be running, but he has stolen eight bases. That's ball two. Lou Pinelli has been in first place since the season has started. He just got Rio back, so he sent out Chris Hammond. He wanted to send out Tim Burtzis, but they need waivers again on Burtzis, so Chris Hammond, the rookie, was sent to Nashville just before the game. Phils need a two out hit. Two balls and a strike. What a hitter tries to do is choose his pitch with a count 2 and 0 oh and 3 1. Carmelo Martinez with that swing looked like he was going to swing at anything that was close. That ball may have been outside. He's way off the plate also. That's on the corner. 2 and 2. Martinez is standing way off the plate and the pitcher has nailed the outside corner twice. Yeah, you wonder whether Martinez can reach this slider from Rio. I tell you, if Von Hayes is running on this pitch and you're the catcher because her has the leg injury, throw straight on through and don't bother about the runner at third base. Hayes draws the throw. He's not taking a very big lead over there. A two out rally by the Phils. Dykstra grounded out. Dalton popped up. Tom Hur singled. So did Von Hayes. And it's two and two and Carmelo Martinez. And now Hayes will go. And Benzinger at first drops behind the runner, and that was a 94 mile an hour pitch. Three and two, two out. Breaking ball, he missed with it at the base of the loader. A 3 2 breaking ball, so he respects Martinez. And now this started off as an easy inning. Now it's a tough one. Well, that's a slider. A lot of pitchers feel as comfortable, if not more so, with the slider throwing it for strikes as they do a fastball. That pitch just outside. Well, the bases are loaded for Ricky Jordan. He has slowed down in his development considerably. 241 average. Still a threat. He's hit four home runs. And Pinella gets up off the bench as the Phils have the bases loaded and two out. That's in at the knees, a call straight. Runner at third is her. Von Hayes at second. And Carmelo Martinez at first. And Nick Leva on the bench probably said, what was Jordan waiting for? 
took that first pitch of fastball and now watches it go low one and one. And you see a fellow is not hitting very much or driving in a lot of runs and that's the case with Jordan. They're just probably taking too many good pitches. Now he's behind on the count one and two up and in. Well that's a bad formula and a good point Jack you take the good pitch down the middle and you swing at the pitch up and in. Watch this pitch crowd Ricky Jordan. Good movement on it too. Uh -huh. Moved in on the batter and now Rio is almost out of the inning. Base had loaded two out here in the first. No score. And a foul out of play. Keeps it one and two. Two hits and a walk have loaded them up. Rio got the first two handled. He looked like he was on his way to an easy first inning. Now he's throwing a lot of pitches. But he's throwing hard. See some who just come off the disabled list to pitch tentatively, but that's not the case here. Jordan has to guard the plate. And a foul on a high delivery. Keeps it one and two. The Phils are trying to get to the 500 mark today. Cincinnati is rolling. They're 25 games over 500 and on their way. Best record in baseball. The Oakland Athletics losing last night. Now they combine a lot of things. Good starting pitching. Probably the best bullpen in years with Dibble, Charlton, and Myers. Even though Charlton shoved into the starting role, he started last night's game. They can beat you offensively with speed and with power. Base had loaded two out, and a foul keeps Ricky Jordan up there. Yeah, the Reds are number one in hitting in the National League, number one in pitching, number four in fielding, and they have stolen 114 bases. That's not a bad combination. <laughs> Good bench, too. Yeah, their pinch hitters are batting over 300. They play straight away for Jordan. Base is loaded. Two out. It's been a good bat for him, even though he may not get a hit. He has battled Rijo. Ooh, that was just missed, and all of the Cincinnati players started to walk off the field thinking they had a strikeout, but Dana DeMuth didn't give him the call. Well the pitch is outside but it's close enough and the catcher Joe Oliver is sitting there. Usually if a pitcher hits your mitt you do get a call like that. It was outside but the fact that he hit the mitt usually you get the strike call but it was clearly outside. Going outside again. They said loaded two out and another foul keeps it two and two. The one thing if you're a catcher the one thing you don't want to do is move too early. The pounding of the mid, a lot of hitters know when you're sitting outside, some hitters peak. So that's why Joe Oliver, after flashing the sign, goes outside very gently. Base had loaded two out, two balls, two strikes to count. Jose Rijo, two, Ricky Jordan. Coming inside this time. And a bouncer to third and a force out. Three left for the Phillies after one half inning, no score. A six three left hander from Uniontown, Pennsylvania, Terry Mulholland on the mound, a record of four and three and 0 and two lifetime against Cincinnati. Here's the lineup for the Reds. Billy Hatcher will lead it off. He's in left. Mary Larkin at short. Eric Davis in center. Chris Sabo at third base. It'll be fun to watch Glenn Braggs for the first time for me. He's in right field. Todd Penzinger at first. Mariano Duncan at second. Joe Oliver the catcher and Jose Rio on the mound and he got through the first. Defensively for the Philadelphia Phillies in left field Carmelo Martinez. I know this is hard to believe but once he said that the only problem defensively he has in left field is with fly balls. <laughs> Len Dykstra in center field coming over from the Mets last year. Von Hayes the right fielder and Charlie Hayes playing third much improved defensively Dickie Thon at shortstop Tommy Herr over at second base Ricky Jordan the first baseman Darren Dalton behind the plate and Terry Mulholland on the mound. 
All on under. We showed you his figures. A record of four and three. 70 innings, 76 hits. He's allowed a half dozen home runs. And we mention that because this is a home run hitter's ballpark. The ball flies here. Jeff Cooper, the trainer for the Philadelphia Phillies, out to visit Mo Holland. I think home plate umpire Dana DeMuth saw something, even though he's having his, his right hand taped. I don't think he could have seen that. Might have been a white uh, yeah. hand aid or something. Yeah, but his right hand's in his glove, so the tape was put on his little finger. Anyway, everything's fine. Tommy Herr. The second baseman might not be able to cover much ground today. We saw him running the bases in the top half. Here is Billy Hatcher, ball one to him. Hatcher, much traveled. Cubs, Houston, Pirates found a home here, and he's helped them considerably. Played an awful lot when Eric Davis was out of the lineup. Third base coach is Sam Perlazzo, who used to be with the Mets, and Tony Perez at first. Mulholland makes it 3 and 0. This pitcher came over from San Francisco in the Steve Bedrosian trade. Ball four. Now this Cincinnati team doesn't need much help. You don't want to walk many, you don't want to commit many errors when you play them. Speaking with Daryl Knowles before the game, and he said that one problem that Mulholland has is when he looks down. Right there, he's picking up his target very well, but he was looking down too much and not picking up his target. And the one thing Knowles, the pitching coach of the Phillies, tries to do is remind Mulholland to keep his eyes on the target. That's his best move to step off and throw over from the pitching rubber. He doesn't. He gets it over there pretty well, but he's quick with that move, too. Hatcher has stolen 24 bases. The batter, Barry Larkin, hitting 324. Pretty good number two hitter. Good hit. play by Dalton there, Jack. That sweeping breaking ball from Mulholland. And sometimes a catcher has to become a first baseman. Instead of blocking the ball, you simply catch it. Good play. Sometimes those left-handers hang on to the ball a little too long. Lead off walk to Hatcher. As I say, you don't want to give these Reds much help in the way of walks or errors. Jordan holding against the runner. And that one caught the corner. That's the first strike he has thrown. The owner of the Cincinnati Reds is Marge Schott, the lady there in the front row, and she constantly signs autographs during the game. Two ladies involved in club ownership, Mrs. Yawkey with the Red Sox. And now Larkin falls in the hole, one ball, two strikes. 28 hits in the first inning for Larkin. 42 runs batted in. He's an effective batter and a great fielder. Hatcher, the runner. Foul ball. Oh, boy. You'll, you'll note that one caught the catcher, Dalton. By the way, Phillies had to put Steve Lake on the disabled list today. Steve Lake, Tom Nieto was recalled from Scranton, Wilkesboro, and the reason Lake was on the DL was because of the fight that they had last night. Dennis Cook hitting Norm Charlton. Dalton did not start last night because he had a collision with the Reds catcher, Joe Oliver, on a play at the plate Thursday night. Foul tips and injuries to a catcher, it seems, come in bunches. Boy, they hurt. That ball can find you, I'm telling you. I don't know how it does it, but it does it. One ball, two strikes. And a pop fly foul, and Dalton couldn't get it. Well, it was playable, but Dalton couldn't get back there. And from a Philadelphia viewpoint, that hurts with a batter such as Larkin at the plate. So Tom Nieto has joined the Phillies. The ball didn't have enough height to it, and it, I think it hit that padding and came down and, and conked Dalton on the shoulder. Yeah, it hit the fence first. So I got to hit again. Right. <laughs> Told you it came in bunches. Ball well, finds you. Watch the pitching motion of this pitcher. Watch his front foot when he delivers to the plate. It is quick. 
That's why you can't run on it. Watch how low he keeps it. Foul ball. Keeps it one and two. A little uh, bit about pitching technique here. In order for this pitcher to deliver quickly to the plate, they concentrate on picking the heel of the foot up first, and that keeps you from making the big high kick. Watch him again. Runner at first, nobody out. See if his heel comes up first. Base hit. Now it's caught by Martinez. And the runner gets back in just in time. That ball kept carrying, and Martinez made a good play. But I wasn't the only one who thought there was a hit when I left the bat. I hope I wasn't the only one. <laughs> ball is really laced to left field. And remember, we were talking about Carmelo Martinez, who comically said that he has troubles with only only with balls in the air. Well, this one's in the air, and Martinez makes a nice play, catching it in the webbing. Billy Hatcher going all the way to second base and retreating and just back in time. Nice play by Martinez. Here is Eric Davis. Look at that batting mark, 225. But you know Davis, ball one. He has a dozen home runs. He's wearing a brace on one of his knees. On that right knee, you can see it in your picture. Very unorthodox style of Eric Davis. High strike, one and one. Most hitters, in order to get into hitting position, start higher with their bat. Look at that unusual style of Davis, and that's why he's vulnerable inside. National League pitchers do not like to pitch him down in the strike zone. You have to establish the fastball inside and up on Eric Davis, and that's what Mulholland appears to be doing. Two balls and a strike, the runner going, and a foul, and it's two and two. His Reds don't sit around. They run, and they have people that can run. Hatcher, 24 stolen bases. Larkin, 22. Davis, 10. Sable, 23. Duncan, 10. They move, and there's the man who directs them. Phillies left three on at the top of the inning. No score here. Ball three. Saw those figures from 89, and this year he's way below his usual batting average. Hatcher will go, runner at first, one out. He's off and running, and he struck him out, and quick tag by her, and the inning is over. Nobody left. After one, there is no score. This is Dickie Thon to lead it off against Jose Rijo. And Larkin will get to it. One out. To end the bottom of the first inning, the 3 2 pitch to Eric Davis, a slider. Watch him swing over it. Dalton, because it's a 3 2 pitch, wants to stay back, get the pitch. A quick throw by Dalton and a quicker tag by Tommy Herr. Look at the location of her. He's not in front of the bag. He's behind the bag. And catchers love that. Why is that? Well, because you don't want to. We talked about it before. You don't want to have a throw that's received in front of the bag and have the hand brought back. You don't want to receive it a yard in front of in front of second base because you can't catch the ball and bring it back faster than the ball can get there. Strike one to this batter, Charlie Hayes. Hayes has hit a half dozen home runs, batting 282. And he is much improved defensively. He had a rap against him as being very poor at third. Now they say he's wonderful down there. Fly ball to right field. And that's Glenn Braggs. Here's a one hand catcher, two up. pitches in the first inning when he gave two hits and a walk he's thrown 33 already but he's on his way to an easy second with Mulholland up there 
Mulholland throws left. Bats right and has had four hits this year. Rio pounded one in there. We talked about that fight last night. Dennis Cook hit Norm Charlton. Charlton had thrown at Dykstra earlier in the game. He had hit Von Hayes earlier this year. And that's the reason the Philly pitcher Dennis Cook hit Charlton. And even though the two are friends, Charlton charged the mound, tackled Cook, Cook, and both benches empty. Out of play, one and two. Heard Norm Charlton on the bench. He's a very aggressive player from the pitching mound, running the bases with the bat. And just hard nose. One and two. Struck him out. And that's the first strikeout for Rio after an inning and a half. No score. No score as the Reds bat in the second with Chris Sabo first up. And ball one from Terry Mulholland. Two hits for the Phillies. They wasted those in the first. Sabo has hit 17 home runs. And a fly ball into center field for Lenny Dykstra. Hey, Lenny, how would you like to win the batting title this year? Well, I, I think that would be something real special for me. You know, it was just like, you know, being, being a starter in the All-Star game. So, you know, I'm going to work hard at it and concentrate every day. It's, you know, it's tough to do. You know, the pitchers are really starting to bear down on me now, and they don't want me to get hit. So uh, it would be, uh, be a great accomplishment. Almost every answer you have given has included the word work. Uh, that's right, Jack. I, I think that's something that you have to do in this day and age, especially with, with the people you're playing against. They're, they're just too good out there. And if you don't do that, they'll, they'll walk all over you. And uh, that's something that I really prepared myself for. Ball one to Glenn Braggs, batting with one out, hitting 344 for his new club. There's a strike, and it's one and one. Dykstra playing center today, and he plays that position well. Richie Ashburn, the last Philly player to win the batting title. Chased a bad ball low, one and two. There's your pal. Ashburn, Richie Ashburn, an announcer for the Philadelphia Phillies, won the National League crown twice and was edged out by Willie Mays twice. A lot of people think he should be in the Hall of Fame. He flirted with it with the Veterans Committee, but he missed again by a narrow margin last year. It's too bad. Rags the batter in a 2-2 count. Got him, and that is the second strikeout for the pitcher as Greg Gumbel joins us from New York. Well, Jack, at Wrigley Field in Chicago, Major League RBI leader Matt Williams adds another to his collection. Number 79 of the season gets Rick Leach home and gives the Giants a 1-0 lead. They've gone to the top of the third. Let's go back to Jack and Tim at Riverfront. Driving in runs is nothing new for Matt Williams this year. Batter now is Todd Benzinger. He is a switch hitter. He's hit four home runs. Has a bit of a bad hand and had a rather unique way of getting the injury. There's one to her. They'll go down in order. We'll tell you about the Benzinger injury when we come back after two innings here. Riverfront Stadium, no score. Todd Benzinger was swinging the bat in the on deck circle the other day and he saw the bat boy out of the corner of his eye and stopped his swing and injured his left hand. That's why he's been in and out of the lineup that and with Hal Morris playing very well for Cincinnati. Extra doesn't chase many bad pitches. He just did strike one. That's one of the big reasons that Lenny Dykstra is hitting so well. It's tough to convince a young hitter that if you walk more, you hit more. And that's what Lenny Dykstra is doing this year. For the simple fact that he's more selective at the plate. And that's why that graphic was so important. 59 walks so far this season. Ball one, one and one from Rio. What hitters, young hitters say, now wait a minute, you're telling me to take more to hit more? What you're saying is take more, be more selective, and hit more. And that's what Dykstra's doing this year. He grounded the first to start this game. Didn't have a very good game here last night with a couple of strikeouts, took the collar, and made an error. So knowing him, he'll be bearing down doubly here today. 
We're up in Southern California around Anaheim Stadium. And his idol in high school, Rod Carew. Base hit, nothing to it. Lead off single in the third for Dykstra. Nice, easy, level swing. Rod Carew led his league in hitting seven times, and that's what Lynn Dykstra hopes to do. If he does it, it'll be the first time, and as we saw, the first time for a Phillies player since 1958. This is a slider. It hangs up in the strike zone, and Dykstra with that great plate coverage. He's moved closer to the plate this year. He and Dennis Minky, the hitting instructor, looking at tapes of his good year in 1986. They saw that he was away from the plate, and he's moved up and has been very, very productive. Baxter has stolen 18 bases. Benzinger holds against him. To Dolphin. He has a look at the third base coach. Lead off single here in the third of a scoreless game. Phillies have three hits. They left the base and loaded in the first. Extra had lengthened his lead, and that caught Riho's attention. Larry Boa coaching a third great player, former San Diego manager. Rio has allowed a leadoff single here in the third. Alvin watched one go low, one and one. They must consider Dalton a pretty good contact hitter to bat him in the number two spot. Let's see if the Phillies do some running. Riho's not a good guy against whom to hit and run because he throws very hard. He throws up in the strike zone. He has been throwing more ground balls this year, about 50% more ground balls than fly balls. So that would be in favor of sending the runner. And they call a bark. A block is called by the first base umpire, Charlie Williams. Runner at second, nobody out. I think it was on the step. You have to step toward first base. And that's what Charlie Williams is saying. That he deceived the runner by not stepping toward first. Most of the box nowadays are called by not stopping. I'll tell you, that was very close. Looked like he stepped toward first to me. A little spin move. I didn't, mm -hmm. didn't look like a block to me, but. Charlie Williams called it. And a foul out of play. Dalton would like to move the runner to third. And Rio would appreciate getting a strikeout now. I think that's what Darren was trying to do with that swing, but now it's one and two, two strikes, so you just protect. Moving the runner along becomes secondary now. Dykstra is the runner. Breaking ball and a high fly ball going to go into the seats. Back about four rows. Keeps Dalton up there one and two. A late arriving crowd because of the rain we had this morning. The rain was considerable. John Vukovic is the first base coach. He's a good instructor. He had the Chicago Cubs job for half a day. <laughs> when, when Dallas Green was the general manager, he hired John Vukovic, and at 12.15 in the afternoon, Dallas Green got fired, and Vukovic hadn't signed his contract. So Jim Fry, the incoming general manager, hired Don Zimmer. Up and in. Two and two. That's when Zimmer got the job. Mm -hmm. And Vukovic out. Two and two to Dalton. Single and a balk. By the way, was the third balk called against this pitcher this year. Dalton took it low. Full count, three and two. I 
Turn this batter about straight away in a respectable depth. Ball flies in this park. A lot of home runs here at Riverfront Stadium. Probably the best hitters park in the National League. Hard surface and light air. Hitters love that. Now fly ball will advance the runner. Eric Davis lopes to the track. Baxter goes to third with one out. Him imperceptible there but I think if, if you're trying to move a runner from second to third with nobody out I think you ought to get credit with the sacrifice if you do it even if it's a swinging play if in the official scorer's judgment he moves the runner from second to third and a guy visibly shows that he's trying to do it I think it ought to be a sacrifice people might say well he's not trying to do it but think about it on a sacrifice fly a lot of guys aren't just trying to hit a fly ball well, his teammates appreciate what he did, and the you infield bet. comes in. For Tommy Hur, who singled his first time. Up high. We're at Riverfront Stadium in Cincinnati. Tim McCarver and Jack Buck. No score. Third inning. Runner at third. One out for the Phils. They left three men on in the first. Went down in order in the second. And Cincinnati has no hits in the first two innings. It's up to her. Getting room up the middle, and that's inside for Walton. You could say Dalton moving the runner, Len Dykstra to third, doesn't show up in the box score. Everything shows up in the new box scores. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Everything. They're you can't, yeah, you can't say that anymore. You can't say it doesn't show up in the box score because everything's there. It's almost like a box score takes up a half a page. You used to take up just a little blurb in, the, in a column. Now it's a half a page. On our third one out infield in and up line drive base hit and the Phillies jump on top second hit of the day for Tom Hur. so the Bach hurt three hole in the Reds in 1985 you mentioned that year Tommy Hur had one hundred and five RBIs with only eight home runs well you talk about a good clutch hitter. To have that many RBIs and that few home runs, you have to be very productive in situations like that. Tommy Herr is, he was, and the Phillies on top, one to nothing. That was their fourth hit, and the batter is Von Hayes. That's low. Hayes singled his first time. The Phillies have played tough against Cincinnati. One four out of ten. Hayes can get on a streak where he hits the long ball, but not Libby. That was close. The throw is right on the foot. Todd Bensinger catches the ball, and it, he almost applies the tag as he caught the ball. It was the back foot. He missed the front foot. That's my fair ball. Looks like a double play. 3-6-3. One run for the Phillies on two hits. Nobody left. They lead. We'll return to Riverfront Stadium after this word from your local station. Mariano Duncan steps in. Dodgers gave up on him. He came over here with Tim Leary for Cal Daniels and Lenny Harris. And a pretty good deal for both. He hits it to the shortstop, Dickie Thon. Take a look at what some people think is the strongest division in baseball. Oakland and Chicago both lost last night. The White Sox two games behind Oakland. Ricky Henderson leading the league in hitting an on-base percentage, kind of like Lenny Dykstra, also steals with 42. Bobby Thigpen, a blown save opportunity last year, but what a remarkable year he's having. 31 saves ahead of Dave Rigetti's pace. Rigetti had 46 in, in 86, and Jack Darty, first baseman designated hitter for Texas on a tear. Here is Joe Oliver, the catcher. He took strike one. Adding 247 with a half dozen home runs. This fellow worked his way up the Cincinnati ladder. He paid his dues in the minor leagues. They're pretty happy with him, aren't they? They really are. Joe Oliver and Jeff Reed Reed a left handed swinger. They are more than adequate behind the plate. 
Outside ball two two and one with one out. Oliver almost paid his dues the other night when he had that collision with Darren Dalton the Phillies catcher. Up the middle second baseman has time and safe. Now I bet Tommy Hur wishes he'd taken a little more time than he took. Well, well, you can't stop on the artificial surface. That's the one difference that an infielder and one luxury doesn't have. You got to throw on the run because when you try to stop, your foot slides. You got so much momentum going toward left center field. A fine play by her, but the throw high it pulls Ricky Jordan off the base, and Joe Oliver has an infield hit. First hit for the Reds. Had Jordan caught the ball, he still could have tagged him, and the runner is out. Holland's quick stepping off the rubber two out. He's quick stepping off the rubber and Joe Oliver's slow because how many how many infield hits has he had he's probably tired. <laughs> well, watch this quick play Oliver not reacting quickly and the tag applied quickly by Ricky Jordan Joe Oliver a dead duck. Rio hits it foul. I think what Oliver was probably thinking. Lou Pinella probably was going to put the sacrifice on and Oliver's not a fast runner so he was trying to get that extra step off the base and Mulholland nailed it. This one is a base hit. Right to out. Now Rio bounces one up the middle and picks up the second infield hit of the inning for Cincinnati. Well when an infielder is forced to field the ball deeply on the artificial surface it's almost surely a base hit regardless of who's running here's a slow footed catcher and a pitcher with two infield hits back to back but when Thon feels that ball in really shallow center field almost everybody's going to beat a ball out like that Billy's lead one to nothing bottom of the third Billy Hatcher drew a walk there's a close play at first he darn near got Rio he's dangerous this pitcher. <laughs> I'll tell you that was very very close high tag by Jordan there's a strike into the batter and Riho has length has shortened his lead considerably down there at first base watch yeah, and when you do that early in a ball game you really thwart a team that can run in the reds you mentioned 114 stolen bases Asher gets a base hit over to get a Martinez Second and third, two out. These Reds keep coming after you. Well, that man picked off has already cost Cincinnati. Well, you could say that, but had he not been picked off, Riho's probably bunting. If, if the bunt were successful, maybe you score Oliver. I think you could take that stance. Ball hit off the end of the bat. But unusually, three straight hits, single, single, double, and no runs for the Reds. Second and third, two out for Barry Larkin, who fly to left his first time. He is tough with men on base. Tough to pitch you. He can go the other way with the ball. And the lefty steps off. Cincinnati fans want some runs. They trail one to nothing. Sandberg, Dykstra, then Larkin, then Tony Gwynn. And Larkin, 42 runs batted in. He could put the Reds on top. Time called. Some more folks have arrived after the rainstorm this morning. As we mentioned, they've averaged more than 31,000. They'll have their best attendance in years when it's over. Roll for a ball. They have a base open, but there's not much choice. You either pitch to Larkin or Eric Davis. Even though Larkin's batting a hundred point points higher than Davis, Davis is 
not been swinging the bat well this season. Ball three. Looks like he's going to take his chances with Davis. And because Eric is not hitting much, they just might turn Larkin loose on three and all. Sure. Why not? There's Eric Davis. He'll be up there next. He wears those high top shoes. Ball four. The base is loaded. Second walk by Mulholland. All of this with two out. That's a phenomenon in baseball. The high top shoe. You can see Barry Larkin with the high tops on also. And Barry told me before the game that he doesn't need to be taped with those shoes. Uh, it does offer, indeed, more support to the ankle. Looks like they could go skiing. <laughs> <laughs> Ski boots. He's only got one on. One high boot, one low shoe. Hmm. Huh. Davis hit a grand slam the other day against Zane Smith of Montreal. And he has the opportunity here. I mentioned earlier that Mulholland has allowed six home runs. He'll get his swings, you can bet. On the nothing Phillies spot in the third, Mason loaded two up. Ball. Fans here booing, thinking that that might be a carryover from last night, but there's no way with the bases loaded in a one run lead that that was intentional, trying to get him out. Foul ball, one and one. Rijo is the lead runner over at third base. Down at second, a speedy Billy Hatcher and a fast runner, Barry Larkin. Back to first, and it's up to Eric Davis with two out, and the base is loaded. Eric Davis has five career grand slams. Here's that high fastball again. We mentioned it earlier. You've got to pitch Eric Davis there. But a bases loaded situation, no way he's trying to throw at it. Here's a foul ball, making it two and two. And Mulholland is getting along very well. Moved him off the plate, got a strike. Moved him off the plate, gets strike two. Eric Mulholland. Four and three record, one of the many lefties the Phillies have. Again, the high fastball, and you could see that Eric Davis, against most pitchers, cannot get around on that pitch. We mentioned it earlier. It is rare. Look at that with the bases loaded. His career, 382. It's rare for a right-handed batter to bat like that. Boy, he is a notorious low ball hitter. He might be thinking about going the other way in anticipation of this next pitch. Two and two the count. Got him. So he walked Larkin and he fanned Davis for the second time. That's the third strikeout for Mulholland. Three hits and a walk. A man picked off. Three left after three one nothing Phillies. If you're a pitcher against Eric Davis, this part of the strike zone you want to forget about. No. With the count 1-1, one, one, watch how Dennis Cook works Eric Davis. The 1-1 one, one pitch. Up and in. The one two pitch. Foul back. And now the coup de gras. Now the coup de gras was the slider in on the hands to Eric Davis to get Mulholland out of a big, big jam. Well, he pitched him tight and got him out. The batter is Martinez. First pitch of ball, now a strike one and one. He walked his first time. We're in the fourth. One nothing Phillies. Jose Rijo, the pitcher. Martinez misses the breaking ball. He's in the hole one and two. Martinez, Jordan, and Dickie Thon in the center. And a foul ball. Keeps it one and two. I 
Mike I am with all these Philadelphia left handers. You said Dennis Cook earlier. They got Mulholland and Cook and Ruffin. They have a wealth of left handers. Yes, they do. The one problem for Nick Leva, however, is no official starting rotation this year. It's better than last year's, but he has really had to arrange, rearrange. Bruce Ruffin has been in and out of the rotation. Well, Holland's been on the disabled list. Dennis Cook started part of the year. He's in the bullpen now. That's been their problem. A half swing, and Sabo waits for it. Now flip. Tough to get away from the batter's box when you're jammed like that. At the conclusion of this game, Tim McCarver and I will select the Chevrolet most valuable player of the game. Chevrolet will then donate $1,000 in the player's behalf to the Special Olympics. Leadoff man is gone for the Phillies and Ricky Jordan who left the bases loaded in the first comes up for the second try. On the corner that's a strike. The Phillies also have young Pat Combs who beat the Reds on Thursday night a left hander. They used 15 starters last year. They've used eight so far this year. Halfway through the month of July. Reho to Jordan. Low and away. One and one. A little more brightness here at the ballpark. We might even see some sun before the day is over, but odds are slim. Jordan missed a breaking pitch, and Reho took a little off that one. Cloudy day. But a lot better than it was about an hour before game time and a good crowd here for Saturday afternoon. That's low. They had a fireworks night here in more ways than one last night. And they had a full house. Steve Lake was injured in that rumble and Philly catchers on the disabled list. Jordan swinging at a ball up and in keeps it two and two. Tom Nieto has been added to the staff of the Philadelphia Phillies. Number eight there is Charlie Hayes. One to nothing. The Phils on top in the fourth. With one out. In the right field and Braggs got to it. Had a good jump on the ball. You know Tim you get a fellow like Pinella coming over from the American League and he knows who can play in the American League and who can't. He also knows about young prospects. That's why he got Hal Morris and Tim Leyana and now Glenn Braggs. It's funny about catches. You see the catch. You don't see the jump that the outfielder usually gets an excellent jump as you said Jack. And that made the catch rather easy Made a tough play look easy and there are two out for Dickie Thon. Time grounded to short his first time. He's hit five home runs, and you know the trials and tribulations he has had with his vision after being struck by a pitch ball a few years ago. Up and in, one and one. He doesn't like that. He doesn't like that. He'll say something. Yeah. He was blunted by a Mike Torres fastball back in April of 1984. He's been hit only twice uh -oh. since then. There's Dickie Thon getting into it the catcher Oliver here we go again I don't think anything will happen they didn't think anything would happen last night either well, you can certainly understand the sensitivity of Dickie Thon and here comes the bullpen now yep <laughs> Charlton Dibble and Myers all came from under the tunnel here at Three Rivers Like it's over, gratefully. Dickie Thon objects to that and he yelled something out to the pitcher. Then he and the catcher, Joe Oliver, exchanged some words. And the umpire, Dana DeMuth, jumped in between the two of them. Well, you can certainly understand his sensitivity. He's only been hit twice since then. But here's a pitch inside. On the other hand, if you're a pitcher, just because Dickie Thon was hit and critically injured 
six years ago, you can't stay away from the inside part of the plate. That's the irony involved. A pitcher's got to continue to pitch inside, and I'm sure a warning will be issued to Nick Leva and to Lou Pinella now. And the next time a pitcher comes close, if it was intentional in the umpire's opinion, then the manager and the pitcher will be ejected. As Tim mentioned, he's been hit twice, only twice, since that injury in 84. There's Lou Pinella. You'll get a warning too, sir, here in a moment. From John McSherry. McSherry is the crew chief of these umpires, and he's talking with Nick Leva. And everything is understood. I'll tell you, I, Jack, I do not think that that was intentional. I think Rio was trying to pitch inside. I mean, it's no more intentional than Terry Mulholland pitching Eric Davis inside with the bases loaded. You're trying to get him out. And if you don't do that, Dickie Thon will kill you. That's He'll right. hit the ball out of the park on you. But here, here's a situation that it appears today that has taken on last night's characteristics and problems. Last night it was Norm Charlton who was hit by Dennis Cook fastball. He was hit in the thigh, and it was nasty last night. And one of the nasty boys was in it. That started off in slow motion, and then it, it built to the climax, and there was a lot of pulling and tugging, and that's where Steve Lake was injured. That's where the injuries usually occur. It should really be for the two combatants. Why is baseball different from hockey? I mean, in hockey, any of the other combatants that, that come in, any of the other combatants, are they're the ones who are fine. Not only the two guys involved in the fight, there's Norm Charlton right there, one of the nasty boys. He was the one who was hit last night by Fish. Okay, Thon's back in there. The two out, one ball, one strike. Phillies leading one to nothing, fourth inning. And Riho, the pitcher. Sable picks it, and the girls go down one, two, three. After three and a half, it's still one nothing Philadelphia. This will be the only punch thrown today. <laughs> Everybody here in Cincinnati. Talking about the Pete Rose incident, and here's the ball through the third baseman, and Sable ends up at second base, leading off. Sable had flied to center his first time. Wound away in the bottom of the fourth, and that's the tying run. Well, I don't know. Chris Sable, you said yours would be the only punch thrown. Sable punches this ball past Charlie Hayes at third base. Charlie Hayes, a, a, a fielder this year who is leading all National League third baseman in fielding percentage. A 44-game errorless streak, but he is pinned with an error on the Chris Sabo sharply hit ball. That was the ruling, and Glenn Bragg takes ball one. Now these fans are howling on every inside pitch. That's Charlie Hayes. Came over with a bad feeling reputation, but has improved considerably. Vukovic and others, Dennis Menke, Larry Boa have helped him. The one good thing about Charlie Hayes' reputation, it was only for a half a year. Sometimes in baseball, reputations speak louder than facts. All Holland, the pitcher. Sabo, an alert base run. That's a base hit. First and third, nobody out. Sabo had to make certain the ball went through. And now the hits are even at four apiece. A third base coach, one of his responsibilities is to tell the runner at second with none or one out to make sure the ball goes through, and Sabo did that. Consequently, he can only go to third. First and third, nobody out. The Reds left the base and loaded in the third. In addition, had a man picked off in that inning. And had another man out stealing in the first. Benzinger grounded out to second his first time. That's a foul ball. Benzinger, one of the more proficient hitters at getting a runner home with less than two outs. Fly ball, ground ball, what have you. 84% of the time he's done it, while the National League average is only 55%. Isn't that extremely low? 
getting the runners in from third base the National League averaged 55 percent so a little over half the time and only that do they get the runner home with less than two outs strike two the count pitcher Mulholland would like to strike up and the Phillies would give up a run for a double play they're playing back at second and short Sabo at third Braggs who got the single on at first up and in and listen to the crowd Mulholland has pitched seven the innings Struck out only 21. And another foul trying to go to right with a breaking pitch. So it's a situation well, where Mulholland may want the strikeout, but he, but he doesn't get that many. Only 2.7 per nine innings. First and third, nobody out. One nothing Phillies. Got him. Pumped it right by him. Benzinger becomes the fourth strikeout victim for Mulholland. Little extra juice right here. Fastball up and in to Todd Benzinger. And you could see Perry had a little extra mustard on that one. He'll face Duncan. He grounded to short his first time. score in this inning. They've left three and lost two other runners. Foul ball on the off-speed pitch. Duncan is driven in 27 runs. We have golf for you next on CBS, the Ameritech Senior Open. You see Chichi Rodriguez is up among the leaders in that acting. That's right after baseball on CBS Today. Tied and the other man stops at second. Good piece of hitting by Duncan. Mariano Duncan batting 410 against left-handed pitchers. He also leads the Reds in extra base hits against left-handers, and he rifles this to third base. Look at Glenn Braggs picking up his third base coach. There's no reason to pick up your third base coach. Even though uh, Sam Perlazzo's holding him up, I'll tell you, with one out, in my opinion, Braggs has got to be thrown out trying to go to third base. He runs fairly well. The outfield is wet. It's tough to throw the ball. It's tough to grip the ball. I think Braggs has got to be thrown out at third. There's our next hop. What's going to come of this? You got a force out there and a double play to end the inning. One off the glove of Jordan to the second baseman and over to third for a double play. But the Reds get the tying run. They had two hits and an error, one, one after four. If you're a base runner, you're reminded to watch the line drives and watch Duncan and Braggs do exactly that. Ricky Jordan, a terrific play, a high leap. The ball snags in the webbing of the glove. Over to Dickey Thon, and now it's elementary for Charlie Hayes to make the tag on Glenn Braggs. It looked like Braggs to me thought it was still a force play or still thought a force play was in effect. When once that play's made at second, now the force play's taken out. Here is a strike call to the leadoff hitter, Charlie Hayes, whose error led to a Cincinnati run. He tied 1 1 in the fifth. Two. Think about what would have developed, however, if Braggs is on third base. Jordan's forced to hold the runner on, and instead of making that, that catch and get, getting a double play, then it's a single to right field, and the Reds have a big inning going. Charlie Hayes strikes up. That's the second for Rijo. Look how far outside Joe Oliver is, and the split finger. Gets Charlie Hayes. It's one of the reasons they talk about wasting a pitch with a strike two count. Something good might come of it. Yeah, that hitter's in a defensive position. He's protecting the outside part of the plate and is simply more prone to swing at bad balls with a count one and two, oh and two, than he is two and oh, two and one. 
Well, the Beach Boys are here. That last double play in the previous half inning went three, six, five from Jordan to Thon to the third baseman Hayes. One out in this inning. And here's the pitcher up there. Ball Holland who fanned his first time. Just a bad ball, one and one. Had four hits this year. Larkin will gun him down. Two out. Here's the way the scoring has gone in this game. Philadelphia got a run in the third. Dykstra, a base hit, Bach to second, and her drove him home. And then Mariana Duncan drove home the run after an error to tie this game, and we're 1 1 in the fifth. Two quick outs, and now this pitcher is retired six in a row. And Lenny Dykstra takes his time to allow Mulholland to grab a breather on the bench. Dykstra's average 354. He's picked up a point to this point. Drive one. I don't know how many innings they expect to get out of Riho today, Tim. Well, just coming off the DL, his last start, June 28, I would imagine six innings as opposed to pitch count. Remember, he had thrown 30 through, 33 pitches through two innings. Dykstra took it low, one and one. Dykstra used to do a lot more pumping for the fences when he was with New York, and then when he first came to Philadelphia, he's kind of forgotten that department now, although he does have four home runs. the entire playing field to get his base hits two and one the count that's one of the worst things that a young little hitter can think about is home runs Lenny Dykstra is not a home run hitter and the worst thing that can happen sometimes is for him to to go deep one time he thinks he's strong enough to hit him with consistency two and two the count with two out Cincinnati starting the day Nine ahead of the Giants. You talk to their people, and they're very confident that they're going to go right down the line and win the division. I don't think that there is a player in baseball. I think Lenny's got something in his eye right now. One of the grounds crew talking about changing changing the dirt at Veteran Stadium said all the old dirts in Len Dykstra's uniform. <laughs> I don't think anybody gets any dirtier playing than Dykstra. And he can spoil good pitches these days as he just did. He I'll tell you he is a character a lot of movement in the fingers with the bat a lot of animated facial expressions he and John Cruck teammates the two most animated guys in the National League. Watch his fingers now. <laughs> oh. Oh, watch his feet as he walks away. That's the third strikeout for Riho. Set them down in order. We're still 1-1 one, one in the bottom of the fifth. Talked about Len Dykstra and that finger movement. He was hoping he was going to let his fingers do the walking, but instead, his, 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 he's going to walk to center field. Here is Riho hitting the ball to the shortstop. And Dicky Thon throws high but out, and there's one gone in the bottom of the fifth of a 1 1 game. Dykstra slamming his helmet and his bat down, and we think that Dana DeMuth fined him $100. It's an automatic $100 fine in the National League. Not an ejection, but an automatic fine of $100 when a player throws the cap down and the umpire writing that little note to league president Bill White. Lenny Dykstra was a bad boy. I read, it, I read his lips. I think he said the other umpire called me out Friday. I think that's what I saw him say. There is Dykstra, dirty again. He gets dirty striking out. <laughs> Billy Hatcher is up. 
And a fly ball into left, and it carries only to the track for Martinez. Two up. Bottom of the fifth, 1-1 one, one the score. These two pitchers are giving us a good exhibition today. Barry Larkin, University of Michigan. He grew up in Cincinnati. His brother, quite a basketball player at Xavier University. They're hoping to make it in the pro ranks eventually. Barry, one of three players on the Reds who went and played baseball at the University of Michigan. Hal Morris and Chris Sabo, the other two. Joe the bunt takes a ball. With two out, he's going to left and he's what? Bo Schimbeckler tried to talk Larkin into playing football at the University of Michigan. He said, why don't you play a game where something hits back? Fly ball, it's going to go foul. Jim Beckler, Jim Beckler said baseball is a sissy sport. You hit it, but there's nobody to hit you back. In football, at least you got somebody to hit you back. And so Jim Beckler looking with scorn on baseball. And what is Jim Beckler now? The president of the Detroit Tigers. <laughs> I don't know why when a guy is really good in baseball, he would pick football over baseball. No. Well, Bo Jackson right now, probably Deion Sanders of the Yankees that dilemma it's a nice dilemma to have the ability to play both sports professionally two balls and a strike the count to Barry Larkin with two out in the fifth apparently the rain's going to stay away the rest of the afternoon foul ball two and two the Reds have stranded four Hit into two double plays and had a man picked off. Popped up and in front of the dugout there is a play for Dalton. Down in order Cincinnati after 5-1-1. CBS Sports presents Major League Baseball. Today's game is brought to you by General Motors. GM is putting quality on the road. Sears Weather Beater, the paint that lasts a long, long time. And by the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. And you saw a picture of Fountain Square, then the bridge over to Covington, Kentucky, and an outside look at Riverfront Stadium in the Saturday afternoon crowd. Watching this game go into the sixth inning, and we're tied 1-1. This stadium was first occupied in 1970. It's funny with the Pete Rose problems. The last guy to triple at Crosley Field was Pete Rose. The first guy to triple here at Riverfront Stadium, Pete Rose. Pete's sentenced five months, three months and a half way house, and nine months probation, a $50,000 fine on Thursday and he will be in incarcerated in Ashland Kentucky on August the 10th Ryan Sandberg with his 25th home run and they're tied 1 1 in Chicago as we're tied here with Dalton up there one ball one strike to count I had a tough time dealing with it Jack on the latter part of the week yesterday everybody's talking about the induction of Pete into the Hall of Fame here's a guy who's going to prison it seems like that there are things a little bit more important than the Hall of Fame, but that seemed to be the most prominent topic this week. Strange thing. He cannot be considered for the Cincinnati Baseball Hall of Fame until he is reinstated into baseball by the commissioner. There's a foul by Dalton. Two and two. That news just came out yesterday. So he can't go into the Cincinnati Hall of Fame, and there's great debate as to whether he belongs in Cooperstown. And he's not supposed to attend any baseball functions. What if he's voted into the Hall of Fame and he's still ostracized from baseball? Before reinstatement, if indeed reinstatement ever occurs, how in the world can he be voted into the Hall of Fame and then maybe not be able to attend the ceremonies? <laughs> Here the fly ball by... The batter Dalton caught by the shortstop Larkin for one out, and Greg Gumbel has some info for us in New York. 
Well, Jack, the wind is blowing in at Wrigley Field today, but it doesn't matter to Sandberg. As you mentioned, his National League leading 25th home run of the season pulls the Cubs into a 1-1 tie at Wrigley Field. Let's go back to Riverfront. Here's a foul ball by Tom Hurry. You saw the Sandberg home run. Giants and Cubs, 1-1. Of the two top teams in the Western Division doing battle this afternoon. The Giants up in Chicago and the Reds at home. Cincinnati plays very well at home. 29 and 13 their record here. Murr takes a ball. He's had two singles and he has driven in a run. Cincinnati manager having difficulty manufacturing runs today. And Nick Leva, head man of the Phillies. One for the second baseman, Duncan. Tim, you saw Duncan playing shortstop for the Dodgers. He's much more at home at second base. Yeah, he's not switch hitting anymore, and of course, there's no way he's going to play shortstop with this team. You talk about Pinella being upset with a run, the lack of run production today. How about the Lou being upset with the comments made by George Steinbrenner in his testimony to Faye Vincent, the commissioner of baseball, implying that he was protecting against Lou Pinella when Howard Spira paid the $40,000 and actually Steinbrenner implicating Pinella an allegation and George called Lou Friday and Lou said, hey, George, the cat's out of the bag. The public statement's already been made. Lou said, George says he cares about my family. Well, how can he care about my family and make comments like that? I don't understand it. There's another decision to be forthcoming. 0-2 to Von Hayes with two out. This might be the last inning for Riho. Down in the right field corner bullpen of Cincinnati, Rick Mailer is warming up. Miller ordinarily a starter, but he's seeing bullpen duty these days. Still 0-2 to Von Hayes. He is singled and grounded into a double play. Hills have been out hit 5-4. Hills have made the only error and that led to a run. Down and in one and two. You'd have to judge this performance by Riho as very encouraging for Cincinnati. He's just off the disabled list. He's allowed one run, four hits with two out in the sixth inning. Struck out three and walked one. Two and two. Well, he's got their run in the third. The Reds tied it in the fourth. short left and it falls. I think he broke the bat with that one a two out single by Hayes his second hit the hits are even at five apiece. Any hitter would exchange a bat for a hit any day they make plenty of bats but they don't make many hits a clunker to left field by Von Hayes. And it gives Carmelo Martinez a chance to bat they'll hold against Hayes he's a threat to run. Back into the lineup, Von Hayes. He had a contusion in the left bicep. He's a threat to run. He has stolen eight bases. Breaking ball makes it ball two, and Oliver wants to talk with Rio. He might be running out of gas here, and they're getting a pitcher ready in the bullpen. We're at Riverfront Stadium, Cincinnati. Tim McCarver and Jack Buck were tied 1 1, top of the six, two out, a runner at first. Tom Hurd drove in the Philadelphia run, and Mariano Duncan got one home for Cincinnati. And just about ready when needed is Rick Mailer in the bullpen.
tell you, when a manager comes off the mound and is looking right at the bullpen, he's still looking down there. He's ready to make a move. I would think that if Riho loses Martinez, that Lou, look at him looking down to see if Rick Mailer's all right. I would think that he'll make the move and take him out of there. But for now, he's leaving him in to pitch to Martinez. That count goes to ball three. Well, what has Riho done in his first game back after an injury? 97 pitches. Well, that's enough. Three strikeouts, one walk, five hits. Swinging on three and all. He hit it straight up. And who wants it? The third baseman makes the catch. Now the Phils have left four and will return to Riverfront Stadium after this word from your local station. Eric Davis has struck out twice. Leads it off. It's a foul. Davis fanned in the first inning into a double play and then struck out and left the bases loaded in the third. A 223 average at the moment. One and one. And you don't want to be around if you're an opposing pitcher. When Davis gets hot, he can hit him out in all portions of the park. Like that. that he was throwing earlier in the ball game. There's a fly ball to left by Sabo for the first out as Martinez takes it down. It appeared that the fastball to Eric was in exactly the spot that Mulholland, Mulholland wanted it, and it ended up exactly in the spot that Davis wanted it, about 380 feet away. He didn't hit that ball good, but just good enough to clear the fence by several feet. Quite a few other parks in the National League, that ball would have been an easy out for Dykstra. But the Reds take the lead, two to one. And this one's popped up to the right side, foul to Jordan, now back there again. Two out. A run home for Cincinnati on the Davis home run, his 13th of the year. He took extensive batting practice with Tony Perez throwing to him yesterday. Tony Perez, an interesting name that will be eligible for the Hall of Fame. We talked about Pete. Tony Perez will be eligible after the 91 season. There's Doggy, known affectionately as Doggy. Also, Tom Seaver. All in the same year, so the voters will have some tough choices. Here are the strike to the batter, Todd Benzinger, 0 for 2. 1992, they'll be voting, and the four front runners will be Pete Rose and... Tom Seaver and Tony Perez. Perez, a great, great RBI man. 379 lifetime home runs. I think he had a grand slam home run his last game. Certainly the last series that he played. Oh, and two to Benzer. Boy, the Reds were good then when they had Perez and Rose and Morgan and Bench and Concepcion and Griffey. <laughs> they were good. There's Nick Leva. He's behind now. Two to one here in the sixth. Ida Benzinger. Baby face sort of fellow. Grew up right outside of Cincinnati. There, Rob Dibble in the dugout. What does that mean when he has that hat turned backwards? Up the middle, base hit. 
seven hits for Cincinnati. Nice hitting by Bensinger. This is a tough pitch low and away, and Bensinger takes it right back through the originator. Mulholland gets a glove on it, but it trickles on into center field. And it allows Duncan to bat with two out. When Dibble has that hat turned around, he calls that the rally cap. Well, it's worked in the center. Home run by Davis, and the Reds lead two to one. Smart. Good breaking pitch from the lefty. Well, there's nothing doing in the Philadelphia bullpen, but the pitcher is due to bat fourth in the seventh inning, so we'll look for some action down there shortly. Mailer has come in from the Cincinnati bullpen and he'll be pitching. He chased a high delivery and hit it to the right fielder, Bon Hayes. One run, two hits, one left. After six, it is two to one. Favor of the Reds. Time of Atlanta takes over the pitching in the seventh inning for the Reds who lead two to one. Over at first base, Hal Morris, formerly of the Yankees, batting in the number nine spot now. And the leadoff hitter, Ricky Jordan, 0 for 2. Left the base at loaded in the first. And into a force out and lined out to right in the fourth inning. He's a threat to tie this one. And Mailer's pitching the ball. Mailer has a record of four and three with one save. And he went to the bullpen without any whimpering. And he throws a strike. Down in the Philadelphia bullpen. Ackerfeld has been a pleasant surprise warming up. Daryl Ackerfeld. Too. This mailer has a terrific off speed pitch and he uses it in critical situations. He will throw the curveball in any count. Doesn't matter whether he's behind in the count or not. Like that, and a little pop fly that's going to be handled by Duncan. Everybody talks about the double switch. What does it actually mean to the lineup? Hal Morris is now batting ninth, and the pitcher, Rick Mailer, batting sixth. So you have your pitcher in the sixth spot, Hal Morris, because Joe Oliver is leading off in the bottom of the seventh. Hal Morris will be batting second to up in the bottom of the seventh inning. Uh, strike to Dickie Thon, who's grounded out twice. He protested an inside pitch earlier and almost started a little fracas here. And he hits it to short to Larkin. He's the second out. They're two gone. You know that Hal Morris on that play at first base, Tim, it appeared to me, looked like he double clutched and came very close to bobbling the ball, which wouldn't have been, which would not have been a put up. There are two gone. They tell me he's been playing very well at first base, and in addition, he is hitting a ton. Batting 407. Morris. Two out. Foul ball off the bat of Charlie Hayes. You saw earlier when Mailer was behind on the count two and one how he used that breaking ball to his advantage. Yeah, he, he uses his, his uh, curveball like most pitchers use their fastballs. Like there's an off street curveball, strike two. There's a real lollipop he threw up there. Even changes off his change. <laughs> 61 miles an hour. Slow, slower, and slowest. That's what I throw when I try hard. That one just missed. Thought he had him struck out one and two. We want to wish Scott Johnson well. He's a member of our technical crew and he's leaving CBS after this game. On speed curve, struck him out, tagged out. The inning's over. Easy inning for Rick Miller. Seventh inning stretch time for the Reds who lead two to one. The 
CBS radio folks working the game today are Jim Hunter and George Grant. And here we go into the bottom of the seventh inning with the Reds on top two to one number eight hitter leads it off catcher Joe Oliver An infield hit he was picked off he's one for two and it's still Terry Mulholland pitching because the Phillies went down in order in the top of the inning. We also promised Nick Leva that we would wish his dad a happy birthday watching in Ontario California. And Dennis Minky, the batting instructor of the Phillies, 50 years old today, the big 5 0, huh? One ball, one strike. There, Nick Leva had the ball club perking. When it gets Kruk and the others in there, he has a good hitting lineup. And certain ball clubs cannot handle the left handed pitching of the Phillies. But as Tim mentioned earlier, they've had trouble keeping their rotation together. Two and two, and Mulholland still popping the ball. Joe Oliver. Foul ball. This batter has played at Billings, Montana, Cedar Rapids, Tampa, Vermont, Chattanooga, Nashville. So he's worked hard to get to the big leagues. Any pieces that one two and two. Tell you the number eight hole has been very productive for the Reds. Ten home runs and 51 RBIs out of the number eight spot this year. Foul ball again two and two. Shared primarily by Mariano Duncan early in the year and by Joe Oliver Jeff Reed the catching tandem. Terry McGriff was the one. Here's another foul. Terry McGriff is a youngster that the Reds were hoping would take over and be their everyday catcher. It can be tough. As you well know, Mr. McCarver. That's outside. Three and two. Now Morris will bat next in the number nine spot. Hit. What a good at bat that was by Joe Oliver. And he's going to get a couple. A leadoff double. Now don't get picked off, Joe. That's what happened to him in the third inning. <laughs> this ball laced to left center field, and a good at bat is really all you want, even if you make an out on a ball like that. If you hit it well, after working the count to three and two, you fouled off a couple of pitches. Now it's going to be interesting to see if Hal Morris bunts against the left-hander, Terry Mulholland, even though Lou Pinella likes Morris's bat, even against left-handers. Double all the way for Joe Oliver. Now we might see Hal Morris bunting despite his high batting mark. A 407. Three home runs, 15 RBIs. This is a Run Cincinnati would love to get him when their bullpen going the way it is. Bunt nail this one down. Shows the bunt and fouls it. Kind of jabbed at it. Strike one. Bat in foul territory. Whenever that bat's in foul territory, you'll probably bunt it foul. Guys who teach bunting teach keeping the bat out in fair territory and giving just a little bit to deaden the ball. But you've got to have your hands and bat in fair territory to bunt it effectively. Joe Oliver, the runner at second, is not a speedy runner. It'll take a good bunt. Boy, the first baseman is deep. And it's one and one. In a semi bunting situation, Ricky Jordan is playing deep behind the base. I guess if it's a semi bunting situation, you ought to be halfway, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm surprised at that. Bunts and the pitcher. Two. Oh, he drilled it at him and a run will score. Three to one and the batter down to second base. Sacrifice and an error. No run added in and it's three to one Cincinnati. I'll tell you what, Ann Bolin had a better chance than Ricky Jordan did. I mean, Mulholland makes the mistake. 
of looking at third base. Watch him look at third base first. Now watch him, that look at third base makes him think he has to rush it to Jordan, and he throws a seed over there. I mean a seed. And the ball off the glove of Ricky Jordan. It should be an error on the pitcher, but it could be ruled as an error on the first baseman. But he threw that ball too hard to Ricky Jordan. And Mulholland knew he threw it away. meet the surprising White Sox at soon-to-be history Comiskey. The Cardinals journey to Shea and a foray with the Red Hot Mets next Saturday. This relief break is sponsored by Rollays. Oh, the life of a pitcher. Terry Mulholland just worked, worked, and worked, and all he can do is be a loser here today. Cannot win. He, he gave up. Three runs, eight hits, struck out four, walked two in six innings. Darrell Ackerfelds takes over with his record of three and all. Oh. Here's a bunt foul by Billy Hatcher. This fella has really saved the situation for the Phillies, Ackerfelds. New third baseman and batting in the number nine spot is Dave Collins. Charlie Hayes is out of the game. He was 0 for 3, and Ackerfelds is batting in the number 8 spot. 3 and 0, and 3 saves for Ackerfelds. And they switched off, and he did advance the runner by swinging the bat. Nice piece of work by Billy Hatchet. Top relievers in the American and National League. Dennis Eckersley has the most points. Wins, saves, blown saves. And he has the lead over Bobby Thigpen, who missed an opportunity last night. And Franco's number one in the National League. The RBI opportunity now for Larkin, and there's a chance of a squeeze play. The infield in. Runner at third, one out. Squeeze play, and the buck makes it four to one. Nothing to it. I'll tell you, that was an unusual play because Larkin squared around too soon. It's one of those safety squeezes that we saw a couple of weeks ago when the Cubs played the San Francisco Giants. Look at Morris at third base. Larkin really squaring around too early, and Ackerfell should have thrown the pitch out, depending on a team's policy. You either throw at the hitter and knock him down, or you throw the pitch out. Larkin. Reds are going crazy. Eric Davis. He's going to get two as the outfielders cross signals out there. Might be a double all the way. I think with Davis's speed, it probably is a double all the way. But look at Barry Larkin, how he squares around so quickly. Hal Morris, the runner at third, breaking with the pitch. And Ackerfels, really, it's a simple pitch out. You talk about it in spring training. Watch Morris right here. See, he squares around in ample time to give Ackerfels a chance to either knock him down or throw it outside. But the sacrifice and, and the squeeze play successful, a double for Eric Davis. That's a double all the way for Davis now, and he's at second base. That's the first time that Larkin has sacrificed this year, Chris Sabo is up. First he, time was a charm, too, would it? I'll say an RBI for him. It's 43rd of the year. In the dirt, and a dandy stopped by Dalton. That's ball two. They have a base open. And Bragg's up next. Could just go ahead and put Sable on if they wished and take their chances with Braggs. It's four to one Cincinnati. They trailed one to nothing after three. The breaking ball, ball three. 
And they call a ball. Third base umpire. Bob Davidson called that one. That's his specialty. Bob Davidson calls more box than any other umpire in the National League, and he, he called that one. He, he majored in that in college. <laughs> <laughs> he said that Ackerfeld didn't stop, and that's he a stop. Uh, he that stopped. is a stop. We've seen two box calls today, and both were borderline. And Davidson moved the runner over to third, and that's not that meaningful with two men out. We'll see what comes with a fly ball into left field. That ball may stay fair and hit the screen. It is just foul. It's a foul ball. Foul ball. Martinez worrying about wall and ball jumps when he's in fair territory, but the collision with the wall knocks the ball out. And since he was in foul territory, he jumped in fair territory, landed in foul territory, made contact with the ball in foul territory. Therefore, it was a foul ball. Two balls and a strike the count to Chris Sabo. Nice try by Carmelo Martinez. So they're still trying to get Sabo out rather than put him out. Three and one, but they're not giving him a heck of a lot to swing it. Sabo has hit 17 homers. given to Cincinnati today to go with their nine hits. And all four runs thus far charged to the starter Mulholland. We're at Riverfront Stadium. A nice crowd on a Saturday afternoon is watching the action. The Phillies got a run in the third. Reds tied it in the fourth. Took the lead in the sixth and a home run by Davis. And that in insurance runs here in the seventh. And they lead four to one and Braggs could hurt the Phillies. He's one for three. Strike on the inside part. Over at third, it is Eric Davis. His second hit of the day with a double. And Chris Sabo reached on a walk. I think if Sabo runs, that Dalton will not throw through, not with the speed of Eric Davis at third base. And the pitcher due to follow Braggs, they could then walk him. Right. So the Reds will probably stay put and hope that Braggs does something with two up. This man's a big guy. I didn't realize that. I've never met him before until he came over here. He's 6'3", 210. Came over to the Reds on June 8th for Ron Robinson and Bob Sebra. Sebra involved in that fight in Seattle. Sent to the minor leagues. That's over below. Everybody's fighting. And should Sebra be recalled in September, he would have to serve his five-day suspension doled out by Bobby Brown the president of the American League there's a warrant out for him <laughs> <laughs> he's in Denver right now though <laughs> first and third two out and that ball is fair makes it five to one they hold Sabo up he runs through the sign and he is out oh here comes Leva. is big league chaos at its best. A fair ball right over the corner of the bag even though it landed foul. Sabo runs through the sign at third base. Martinez misses the first cutoff man and watch Dave Hollins the third baseman double clutch throw it inside the line and the tag made and it looked like Sabo was on the plate when the tag was made. I thought he was safe. You thought he was out? No, I thought he was out. You thought he was safe, huh? I thought he was safe. Watch the tag being made when his foot is on the plate. Yeah, I guess you got it right. Yeah. That makes it six to one in any event. And here, Mailer is up. Strike one to him. This was chaotic, though. I mean, Sabo running through the sign at third base. See, that tag wasn't made until late. A great slide by Sabo. And strike two. There's one other thing about it. When a ball hits fair and goes over the base fair and lands foul, most umpires will wave it foul. 
but the call went in favor of Cincinnati from Bob Davidson down there. And you could see clearly the ball did go over the back. The ball just missed one and two. That's why umpires are always kicking those bags on the line and trying to make sure those bags are, are fair. The one in a million shot of making that call, and it was a good call by Bob Davidson. And a strikeout to finally end the inning, but it's a four-run frame for the Reds, who lead six to one after seven. CBS Sports presents Major League Baseball. Today's game is brought to you by Toyota's quality line of cars and trucks. Toyota, I love what you do for me. AT&T, the right choice. And by Nuprin, the medicine that gives you big pain relief in a little yellow pill in tablets and caplets. Cincinnati has out hit the Phillies 10 to 5 and they lead 6 to 1. Philadelphia has kicked the ball a couple of times. And we go into the top of the eighth and Dave Hollins bats for the first time this afternoon batting in the number nine spot against Rick Mailer. Swinging at the first one even though his team trails by five strike one. It will be Hollins and then Dykstra and Dalton. These fellas can put hits together. And a foul strike two. If Rick Mailer can finish it on behalf of Jose Rijo. That will allow Myers and Dibble to get another day off. Help the bullpen. Giants refuse to go down today. They lead two to one in the eighth at Chicago. They started the day nine behind Cincinnati. And a swing and a miss. And Collins was chewed up by Miller. Runners at first and third. Glenn Braggs, the batter. And look at third base coach Sam Palazzo with his hands up. Watch him come up the line, up toward home, and fire the hands up, trying to hold Chris Sabo. But no, sir. Sabo says, not me, because I can slide and avoid the tag, and that's what he does. An excellent slide by Chris Sabo. And Philadelphia is down to their final five outs, and they have Lenny Dykstra up there with one out. Dykstra saying, what, you find me $100 earlier? <laughs> <laughs> Talking to Dana DeMuth, the plate umpire. Mailer in relief of Rio is retired four in a row. Ball one. You know, I think it's interesting to note that salaries have gone up, but the fines have stayed the same. Fines haven't kept up with inflation in baseball. Now that you're out of the game as a player, you make suggestions of that sort. <laughs> <laughs> Ball two. Doesn't affect me anymore, right? The Cincinnati club has a record. They're 46 and one when they lead after seven innings. That's because of that excellent bullpen they have and a diving stop by Duncan Robs. Dykstra. We talked about the ways that the Reds can beat you. Fine, fine play by Mariano Duncan. The Reds can beat you with pitching. Offense, home run speed. Many, many ways. Outstanding play by Duncan. They're fourth in fielding in the National League, number one in batting, number one in pitching. And here's an easier chance for Duncan, and down go the Phillies. One, two, three. Bottom of the eighth, Cincinnati on top, six to one. Third pitcher of the day he is Marvin Freeman. Record of 0 2 with one save, a chance to give him some work. The pitch to the Reds in the eighth inning. We talked about all the elements and the ways that Cincinnati can beat you. Think about this game now the power of Eric Davis that put the Reds ahead in the sixth inning, the speed of Chris Sabo scoring the sixth run and now the defense that you saw in the eighth inning of Mariano Duncan. Also the pitching of Jose Rio and Rick Mailer this afternoon. Here's Marvin Freeman going to work and another base hit for Cincinnati. A leadoff hit for Mariano Duncan. 
They certainly come after you. That's their 11th hit. You know, you look back at that last half inning, Tim, and they pitched to Braggs, who got the double with men at first and third. If the runners have been at second and third, they would have walked him and yeah. pitched to the pitcher. That's true. That's one of the reasons Sabo wasn't sent by Pinella. He wanted Braggs to hit. And perhaps one of the reasons why Sabo ran through the stop sign because the pitcher was coming up next. Yep, that's right. Strike one to the batter, Oliver. He's had two hits today, a single and a double. And there's a strike, strike two. Our score is six to one. And there's the line score with the Reds on top, bottom of the eighth. Big crowd, and they're doing the wave. Strikeout victim against Marvin Freeman. It's a tough job catching on a warm day. Well, with the Reds leading by nine going into today's game, let's look at history. 42 Dodgers had a 10 game lead on August 5th. The Cardinals caught them. And of course, the shot heard around the world Bobby Thompson's home run. The Dodgers leading by 13 games in August. And the Mets beat the Cubs. There was a great stop by the catcher, Dalton. And then most recently, the Cubs overtaken by the Mets. August 16th, they had a nine-game lead. And then in 1978, Bucky Dent's home run capped off the Yankee comeback. And Bucky Dent this year fired in Boston, of all places. One on, one out. Six to one Cincinnati and a foul by Hal Morris one and one. You would think that there would be more cases of that but with teams owning a nine game advantage only four times have they blown the pennant. Because nine games is not if a team gets hot and the other team gets the first place team gets the wheels spinning backwards. That's not a lot of games to overcome over a two and a half month period. Foul ball by Morris one and two. This player, Hal Morris, was in the Yankee chain, played at Columbus up and down a couple of times with New York. This fellow, Lou Pinella, upon getting the job here, wanted him on his ball club, and he's helped. He says it makes it tough for him to make out the lineup. He has Benzinger and Morris at first base. One on, one out in the eighth. Ball two for Marvin Freeman. Carol Ackerfeld's pitched one inning, two runs, two hits, struck out one, walk one. But Mulholland will be the loser if it stays as is. Marvin Freeman knows something about how to tie shoes. He knows something about how to string violins, too. He went to a technical school in Chicago where he learned as a teenager how to restring expensive violins. Kind of a neat hobby, huh? Neat trade. The count goes to three and two. There's Bob Quinn, the new general manager of Cincinnati. He's walked into a winner over here. And he and Camilla got together to acquire Hal Morris for Tim Leary. See if the runner goes. That's Duncan. He's on his way. And a broken bat foul ball. Keeps it three and two. Sounded like Morris broke the bat. Freeman threw that pitch 96 miles an hour. Baseball people get kind of eaten up with that radar gun, though. Velocity alone is way down the ladder in getting guys out. Movement, location, those two ahead of velocity. Runner goes again, and a base hit. First and third one out. That pitch was apropos of what you said, Tim, 97 miles an hour. Yeah, major league hitters can time fastballs. They don't really care how hard it's thrown. I mean, I know Dibble throws 98, 99. You can tell if you know a fastball's coming, you just start a little earlier. Location, deception, uh, movement, all of those things ahead of, of fastballs. Johnny Sane used to say pitching is the art of fooling a hitter. I don't know if it's only that, 
but certainly velocity and I think even baseball people talk about that radar gun as though this were the gauge to the, to gauge a pitchers effectively all the time and it's simply not the batter is Billy Hatcher and a pop fly near the dugout and out of play. The Reds with a chance to add to their 6-1 lead here in the bottom of the eighth inning. I think radar guns are good on rehab programs like for instance today with Jose Rijo coming back from shoulder soreness shoulder stiffness to see if he maintains his velocity over several innings which he did today but just simply to fire up velocity and to think that that's going to get hitters out is an erroneous assumption. First and third one out. And low to the batter Hatcher who has had a walk and a double. Cincinnati's out hit the fills 12 to 5 Philadelphia's made two errors each in a scoring inning. Foul ball one and two. The runner's arm Mariano Duncan at third reached on a hit and Al Morris who got a hit is at first with one up. First and third and another foul off to the right. Mulholland, Ackerfelds and now Marvin Freeman. It's funny about Billy Hatcher traded from the Pirates and no sooner than he was traded and started doing well with the Cincinnati Reds. Jim Leland was talking about the need of another right handed hitter. And swinging at a bad ball low, Hatcher goes down for the second out and the second strikeout for Marvin Freeman. Up comes Barry Lockett. This copyrighted telecast presented by Authority of Major League Baseball may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form without the express written consent of Major League Baseball. First and third, two out. Now the Cubs regain the lead in the eighth over the Giants 3-2. And a line drive it is foul. This combination of a Cincinnati win and a San Francisco loss would make the margin 10 games for Cincinnati and be 11, 11 ahead on the loss side. It'll be tough to catch them even though the Reds have 12 games left to play against San Francisco. the corner looking at the National League West standings it's what it is currently tack on a Cincinnati victory and a giant loss and be 10 games Freeman's 1 1 pitch I drive into the left field corner and it is foul one ball two strikes and now this pitcher is in a spot to strike out the side This lead the Reds have six to one. Or maybe he's bored because they do it so regularly. And so easily, apparently. This pitcher is six seven, Marvin Freeman. Can he get a third one past Larkin? He can bring it, can he? Two and two. Two on, two out, two balls, two strikes. From Chicago. By the way, those Cubs who are beating the Giants today are looking for their sixth in a row. 2 2 pitch to the shortstop and the force out. Eight left for Cincinnati, but they lead six to one. Here in 
in Cincinnati the Reds carry a 6 1 lead into the ninth inning. And when this game is over on CBS we'll have some golf for you to enjoy. It'll be the seniors open being played up in Traverse Michigan. The Ameritech Senior Open coming up right after baseball here on CBS this afternoon. The leadoff batter is Tom Hur. He drove in the first run of this game. And he's two for three on the day facing Rick Mailer. And a strike. Well, our statistician Steve Hurt points out that this would be the second save this year for Mailer. In 11 previous seasons, he had a total of only two saves. Both in 1981, while a member of the Atlanta Braves. He can really give the Cincinnati pitching staff a lift. If he can be the middle man, they don't need any closers. Well, especially after Rob Dibble worked three innings last night. You don't want to use Dibble less than 24 hours later. And again, it, it points up the versatility of the Cincinnati Reds, comparable to the Oakland Athletics. They've got it all. There's a strike, and it's one and two. The Athletics may have a little bit more power than the Reds, but the Reds have better overall speed. They don't have the fastest runner in the game, the best base stealer in Ricky Henderson, but they've got better overall speed than Oakland. The Reds sitting with Pinella and Stan Williams, the pitching coach. Her leading it off, and he hits it back to Mallet. Taylor has retired seven in a row. Tonight on CBS, some good viewing for you, commencing with Paradise, then Beauty and the Beast, and the Vietnam Story Tour of Duty. All of that tonight on CBS. Mandler doesn't look as though he's going to need any help. He has set down seven in a row, two of them on strikes, but they warm up Randy Myers out in the right field corner. Reds leading six to one, one out in the ninth, and Bon Hayes looks at a strike, and Mailer can get that off-speed pitch over. Off-speed breaking pitch missed. There are some pitchers who possess good off-speed deliveries, but they don't use it at a time when it's going to help them the most. But this fellow is very persistent in it. A strike one and two. Well, very shortly, you're going to hear a roar here in this ballpark because the Cubs have defeated the Giants three to two. And a Cincinnati victory would make it a 10 game bulge. So Brantley balked home the winning run. And Brantley was the loser yesterday. Off speed pitch and a little number to Mariano Duncan. Eight in a row by now. Hitters are taught to wait back, and if a pitcher, through his delivery and his pitch, can make a hitter lunge at a ball, then he's got him. And that's what Mailer does with Bon Hayes. Watch the lunge, and he hits it off the end of the bat harmlessly to second base. Now a strike to Carmelo Martinez with two out. 34,000 paid, 44,000 total here at Cincinnati. Missed with that one. One and one. Riho will be the winner. It will be the second save from Miller. And Terry Mulholland will be the loser if it stays this way. And a foul makes it one and two. Miller is a tantalizing pitcher. His brother Mickey was a pitcher for a period of time in the big leagues. The crowd wants it to end right here. Martinez 0 for 2 with a walk. To pitch two and two. Cincinnati is out, hit the fills 12 to 5. He wouldn't go for it. Three and two. Now leading six to one. Miller has to make certain that Martinez swings at this one. Here it is. Here it is, and a foul. He'll do it again, same way. Markey beat Brantley in that cup victory over the Giants. 
There's Marge shot. She's happy. She should be. She is the shock seen around Cincinnati. Cubs have won six in a row. There's one up the middle, and Larkin can't get it. Martinez first hit of the day. And number six for Philadelphia. Martinez runs bases and at the plate. The fellow who probably set the tone for this one when he left the base and loaded in the first, Ricky Jordan. Then he lined out and popped out 0 for 3. Well, Eric Davis did the same thing, but he responded with a home run and a double since then. Ricky has it. So they call a balk on this pitch. Come on, guys. It's 6 to 1. I mean, Hal Morris wasn't even holding the runner on at first base. You know, the pitcher is not trying to fool anybody. It's not as though he's being tricky out there. But the runner goes to second with two out. So the first base umpire called a balk. Third base umpire called a balk. The plate umpire called him. Let's watch the balk move. Wasn't that bad, was it? Especially when your first baseman's not holding the runner on. Ground ball will end it. Larkin with a good throw. Six to one Cincinnati. They are ten games out in front and eleven on the long side. We're going to have an opportunity to come back with a bit of a wrap up here from Riverfront Stadium. On the hill, a six to one victory by the Reds over the Phillies. is Jose Rijo and Chevrolet will donate $1,000 in his behalf to the Special Olympics. The final score is Cincinnati 6-1. to one. The winning pitcher Rijo 6-3. Loser Mulholland 4-4. Four four. Home run by Eric Davis is 13th. Phil's left 5 Reds 8th. For Tim McCarver, Jack Buck, the story from Riverfront. Greg Gumbo coming up. Welcome back to our studios in New York. And uh, one other score on the Major League scoreboard this afternoon at Wrigley Field in Chicago. The Cubs scored twice in the bottom of the eighth inning. Mike Harkey pitched his first complete game of his career, and the Cubs beat San Francisco by a score of 3-2. to two. Now, a reminder for you, coming up next year on CBS Sports, live coverage of second-round action of the Ameritech Senior Open. And next Saturday, we'll be back with more baseball. Some of you will see the St. Louis Cardinals taking on the New York Mets at Shea Stadium, while others will see the Milwaukee Brewers against the Chicago White Sox at Comiskey Park. For now, I'm Greg Gumbel in New York. Thank you for joining us and enjoy your week. CBS Sports presents Major League Baseball. Today's game has been brought to you by Toyota's quality line of cars.